signed with Iran. And Europe, as usual, was pitiful. It just stood by and mumbled because European leaders are afraid of the United States instead of telling the United States the truth. So this is a, another part of it. But anyway, second step is normalizing the diplomatic relations based on the two states. Third step is actually putting in peacekeepers. And the best that I've heard is that this peacekeeping force, which would operate under the mandate of the UN Security Council, would include Americans, would include uh, troops that are uh, drawn from the Arab countries. And the idea would be to create a buffer zone uh, that would protect Israel from incursions like occurred on October 7. And on the basis of this political solution would also demobilize the armed side of Hamas step by step uh, and uh, would show uh, basically that Hamas, uh, uh, which is a political, uh, a military and a cultural uh, force, uh, um, the military side would be ended as part of a political settlement. Uh, and this would be uh, the next step. Uh, the step after that would be actually to promote economic recovery and development after this devastation. There's a lot to be said about this. It's tragic and uh, a measure of human stupidity that in a world that needs so much, the first thing we do is destroy and then have to spend huge amounts simply to rebuild what we destroyed in a matter of days or weeks. But there is a reality now that the Israel has destroyed the habitability of Gaza. Oh my God. Well, mm -hmm. we're gonna have to address this. And so this is a, another reality that needs to be added to the scene. But my basic, point is move to a solution, not to an illusion, not to the status quo, not to what Israel wants right now, which is uh, not to talk about the day after, because we know what Israel wants the day after. They murmur it every few days, which is complete control, which is uh, uh, absolutely unacceptable not to talk about, oh, we need to reestablish the Palestinian National Authority, blah, 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 because this is all fake. <laughs> what we need to do is spell out where the solution is. Two states, international law, living side by side, and with peacekeepers, and disarming the threats to both sides. And this is a very practical a set of steps that could be reached. And I think it's not impossible. There are big issues, by the way, that I don't have an answer to. There are hundreds of thousands of Israelis who would be dead set against what I'm saying. They are settling illegally in the West Bank, many of them based on a religious fervor that they think comes from the book of Joshua from the sixth century BC. Mm. We're gonna have to address this. Addressing it in human terms may mean addressing it gradually over a few years, not violently and brutally. These are human beings, in my view, completely misguided uh, and uh, illegal in their actions. But that needs to be addressed, too. So I don't want to pretend, obviously, that I have a step-by-step -step solution to everything. But the point is we've got to stop faking what's going on right now. The answer has been known for decades. But Israel has become more and more radical. And this is very sad. It's become more and more messianic in its politics. This is weird for the 21st century, but it's actually happened. So I want us to look straightforwardly, clearly at what's going on and understand this is not normal debate about security and so forth. This is about whether there's going to be 
peace and two states or whether there's going to be uh, an is Israeli attempt to dominate millions of Palestinians or brutally suppress them or brutally ethnically cleanse them or kill a lot of them. And to my mind, the only possible alternative and the one that the whole world agrees to is to give political self-determination to Palestine. By the way, there was a vote on that in the General Assembly recently, quite interesting. Uh, every country in the world that uh, voted, voted yes, except for four. Uh, the four were Israel, the United States, uh, Micronesia, country of 113,000 uh, people last time I checked, and Nauru, a country of 12,000 people. Uh, so basically, the whole world has said, get on with it. Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the pressure has to come uh, from inside the United States and from outside. Uh, from inside, public opinion absolutely does not accept the administration line on this. This is very clear in opinion survey after opinion survey. So somebody in the White House uh, concerned about uh, Biden's reelection must be reading this. <laughs> Uh, and must be understanding this is just purely bad tactics from a U.S. political point of view. That's very important. Uh, there's lots of protest in the United States uh, and uh, lots of uh, unhappiness with this. So we're not in any way locked in internally to the politics. It's bad for Biden. Uh, it's bad for U.S. interests. Uh, it's against public opinion. Um, and so this is uh, one point that I would make. It's not like the United States is rousing support. Yes, and it's impossible to turn. Uh, it's actually deeply contested and mainly opposed. Though I acknowledge that in Washington, the pro-Israel lobby has always been very powerful. The military industrial complex is very powerful. And the inertia is also powerful. So I'm not saying it's easy. Now, on the outside, the entire world uh, is basically aligned on this side with one important footnote, which is that uh, a few European countries uh, maybe are not aligned. I don't know what the Austrian government's real position is. Sometimes it's uh, don't you know side with the U.S. or maybe it really is uh, because of more right wing uh, view or whatever. Uh, side with Israel, but it's very few. The problem in Europe is European politicians stop telling the truth about almost anything years ago because all they want to do is side with the United States. And mm -hmm. I think I would just say to European politicians, if you do it, you lose at the polls. There isn't a popular government in Europe right now that it, because it's incredible. This is so much against European, Europe's own political interests. So I would say, think through this honestly, and then say, you know, it's right. We need, we're not against Israel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just need to move to a two state solution. And the United States, you know, come over here, buddy. You know it too. Let's let's move to a real solution. I'm waiting for European politicians to regain two feet on the ground, their head out of the clouds or out of uh, U.S. control, and just state clearly, straightforwardly what is right and also what happens to be in Europe's interest. But by the way, what happens to be in Israel's interest as well, because nothing that's happening is uh, doing anything other than gravely threatening Israel's long-term survival. This messianism, this greater Israel idea, this zealotry of this religious group, this is not saving Israel, this is threatening Israel's survival. So I want European leaders just to think clearly and honestly about this, because that'll also help the United States 
get to the right place. I think there is a lot to say about the European leaders. I think the the European leaders, uh, uh, there are no leaders, you, you know it better. And there is another tiny problem. We will have also an election this year in some European countries, uh, but in the European Union for the European Parliament. And the problem is that everybody, if according to most of the polls, it's to foresee that the right-wing uh, European nationalistic right-wing parties will win. And the problem is they are even at least concerning Israel, they are also in the meantime, also many of their parties, if to go back history, you know where they come from. And this is a historic cynicism. I think that these right-wing uh, fascist parties, now they are outside of Israel, which is yeah. unbelievable for anybody who knows history and who knows how things uh, happened that these parties who are sometimes in internal uh, issues, they are racistic, they are fascistoid right today, but when it comes to Israel, they are supporting the Jewish state. Yeah, you know, su supporting the Jewish state is, uh, um, is one thing, supporting what is called greater Israel to dominate the Palestinians is so uh, senseless for Israel and for Europe uh, that uh, everybody should take a deep breath and understand that. How many self wounds does Europe want? How many crises, how many wars does Europe want around it? Uh, and I would ask uh, the European leaders, you know, th the reason why the right is growing is in part because the so-called center or center left all was gung ho with the United States for NATO enlargement and for the war in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, it's been a disaster for Europe. It's been a disaster economically for Europe. It's been a disaster from a security point of view for Europe. So it's not even left right. It's it's a failure policy that the current European governments have pursued. And they are opening up their way for an opposition to arise. Uh, and that's that's what's happening, in fact. So the reason European politicians, by the way, across the board, you, you look at the approval ratings in Western Europe right now or in the EU, nobody has any support, basically, except the few that stand up for themselves, like Orban or, uh, or Fico or uh, mm -hmm. a, a few others. But the ones that are basically just siding with the United States in this useless Ukraine war are all in their 20% approval ratings or 25% approval ratings and so on. So the main point I would say to Europe is if you go the way not of supporting Israel, that's one thing, but supporting greater Israel for ethnic cleansing and for this terrible thing, all you're doing is making another prolonged disaster on Europe's borders. And if that's in Europe's interest, boy, please explain it to me. This is this is no doubt about it. I think uh, Europe, I think with this uh, policy they, they uh, follow the last uh, tens of years, I think they, it's against their own security, economic, even cultural interests. I think this is something uh, which... You know, I'll give you another example, by the way. Uh, the, the, the politics of the 2010s was dominated uh, by the Syrian refugees. And anyone that knows even the slightest history should understand that uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama uh, and, and a few others decided they would overthrow the Syrian government in 2011, typical regime change operation. That's what created the war and the refugees. Did any single European leader say that, explain that to the public? Not one. So then they wonder, why is their popularity so low? Well, if you don't speak up the truth, what do you expect? And so understand that these 
hegemonic wars of the United States. These are not in Europe's interests. And, uh, and, and that's the same with supporting what Israel is doing in Gaza. It's not a matter of right or left. It's a matter of what's Europe's interest right now. It is not to have a fulminant Middle East war right now. And so European politicians should think about how to defuse a Mideast wide war. You are, you are completely right. I think you convince uh, people like me, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> we are not in, uh, in power. And, uh, uh, but coming back to uh, the issue of this uh, uh, interview, I think now there is a, a, a peace plan it's even economically, we didn't even mention it, but uh, which is interesting for me, since you are uh, uh, also uh, long experienced in economy, I think um, one uh, important, but not so much debated uh, uh, proposal is uh, the establishment of a new UN fund. Uh, uh, UN Reconstruction and Sustainable Development Fund, which which is uh, interesting, should partially, at least partially, funded by reduction of e expenses which traditionally have been spent for armament and war. You know, uh, uh, outside the UN, across the street uh, from uh, headquarters, is what they call Isaiah's Wall, uh, which is the inscription of uh, the prophet Isaiah, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, uh, which says, uh, they uh, shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Uh, nations uh, will not uh, uh, make war uh, uh, on uh, other nations, neither will they teach war anymore. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, you know, Isaiah had the idea in the eighth century BCE of the uh, transforming the military to the civilian use, uh, and uh, we're now spending two and a half trillion dollars a year worldwide on the military. The United States is around forty percent of the world spending shocking because we're four percent of the world's population uh what if we take even 10 percent of that would be 200 billion dollars a year uh so two and a half uh, i'm sorry 250 billion a year uh and so that's the proposal uh create a fund funded by uh basically uh, agreed cutbacks in armaments I should mention that uh, Pope Paul VI, uh, in his encyclical uh, Populorum Progressio in uh, 1967, had that idea. So I don't want to claim uh, any uh, uh, any uh, uh, precedence uh, to this, but I do think it's the right idea. The UN in general does not command much in financial resources. Uh, it needs to have a bigger budget to do good things. And uh, one way would be military cutbacks that are rechanneled to sustainable development. We could continue hours and hours and hours since uh, many things have been already uh, discussed uh, for many years. But it's interesting that now this plan is here. I think, uh, do you have any uh, ideas how to make it even more popular? Do you uh, intend to present it to other international bodies? Uh, and how should this come to reality? I'm uh, discussing uh, these ideas with UN diplomats uh, all the time. Uh, and I've discussed it with the uh, Palestinian uh, diplomats and with diplomats from around uh, the Middle East. Um, there's a lot of resonance with this. I personally am continuing to urge an immediate membership of Palestine in the UN uh, as a UN member state. Um, by the way, Palestine is a state recognized by 140 uh, other states, but it is not recognized as a UN member state, uh, only an observer, as you rightly pointed out. So. 
I am continuing my own discussion of this. Um, basically, uh, with the U.S. government, they don't talk to me too much, uh, but I uh, try to make my views uh, known uh, publicly uh, by uh, writing and posting uh, articles all the time. Um, and uh, I'm writing to politicians in the U.S. who are quite resistant in general because uh, uh, their modus operandi for decades has been never show any, any space at all with Israel. But I'm telling them it's not working. Uh, it's not working from any point of view. You need to rethink this. So they have a few days of rethinking before the Congress uh, comes back. Uh, the White House cannot be uh, very comfortable. We hear lots of stories about pretty harsh talks between the U.S. and Israel right now. I believe that that's true. One of the U.S. Uh, carrier groups <coughs> has been withdrawn from the eastern Mediterranean and is on its way back to the U.S. That is a signal that the U.S. does not want a wider war in the Middle East. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. The U.S. is exhausted of war and an election year it would uh, be the end of uh, Biden's chances at all. So uh, this is the time for pushing the politics because it's a case where the right thing to do, the politically expedient thing to do uh, are the same. Uh, and so I'm going to continue to push hard on that. Do you have any hope in, I think you mentioned it and everybody knows it, I think two thirds of the international uh, states are in favor of this kind of political and economic uh, solution. Unfortunately, uh, they don't have any veto uh, at the UN, but there is something else. There is an uh, increasing number of states working together, I think, uh, and the South African move to the international court is interesting because South Africa, on the other side, is one of the leading uh, member states of this newly established group, the BRICS uh, group. Uh, so, and they have even already established a kind of new banking system, financing system. Do you have any indications or ideas that from this side, uh, more than just political statements will come to support your suggestions? Well, the, the BRICS countries, all of them are on the same side that I've been advocating. Uh, China, Russia, uh, South Africa, uh, India has expressed uh, also uh, some clarity on this. Um, Brazil, certainly. Um, and now you have new BRIC states that have just joined Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, the Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and Iran. It's a powerful group. Uh, they're all on uh, this side. Uh, actually, it's interesting for me, the fact that Iran is now a BRICS member is, is actually going to moderate uh, Iran, make it uh, part of what could be a BRICS-wide consensus uh, on uh, a good solution. So this matters because uh, the U.S. also looks out and says, you know, our diplomacy, we're isolated, whereas China's and Russia's diplomacy is growing in the region. This cannot make anyone happy. And we know that in the U.S. State Department, there's a lot of unhappiness about the U.S. administration policy. We don't hear all the details, but it boils over uh, every few weeks. And so we hear about the protests coming from inside the professional diplomatic service of the United States as well. So I wouldn't give up uh, in any way on a, a political change where the United States one day says, you know, we, we need to move forward to a real solution here. Uh, this is uh, where I think uh, uh, it's very appropriate and timely to think straight and if the European leaders are too afraid to say it in public, they should be saying it. They should be saying it in private to their American counterparts. You have been writing about uh, the ongoing conflict in Palestine, and I wanted to start with the U.S. role in this ongoing genocide in Gaza. The Biden administration has now bypassed the Congress twice to pass emergency arms packages, and this is despite a huge documentation 
about U.S. bombs being dropped in Gaza consistently, including the 2,000 two, two pounds bunker busters that has killed several hundreds. And then there are developments on the other sides, like 60% of Americans don't support uh, Israel in this conflict. There is a new development of U.S. organized labor that is increasingly drawing its support. There are constraints on uh, the fiscal uh, side as the U.S. military spending has exceeded a trillion dollars, including all the emergency packages. And yet we see a very confident Israel about the U.S. support in this ongoing conflict. Explain to us this. Well, I think uh, the uh, confidence is misplaced. Uh, it, it has been the fact for decades that the U.S. political system has uh, backed Israel uh, pretty much unconditionally. But I think that this is no longer true. And uh, I think the Israeli uh, leadership calculations are mistaken. Uh, the public is very uh, unhappy and uh, uh, very worried about the developments uh, in Gaza. Uh, there's very strong opposition to what Israel is doing among younger people. Biden is uh, suffering politically uh, in terms of the opinion polls and election prospects as a result of uh, the disarray of U.S. foreign policy. So I think that if the Israeli government expects that this is the normal smooth ride, they will be mistaken. Now, it's, it's true that there is a powerful pro-Israel lobby. There is a powerful support in the military industrial complex. It has been the norm in the U.S. Congress to appropriate funds for Israel uh, pretty much without question. Politicians like Biden, who's an old man after all, have taken it for granted that a pro-Israel stand is always the right uh, electoral as well as the right money-raising stand. Uh, but I think that this is a wrong uh, assessment by U.S. politicians because the public is not supportive, and it's a wrong assessment, uh, especially by the Israeli politicians, who I think are making a very, very serious miscalculation. Just to just to uh, stay on this point, I mean, it is often said that while the American public has a huge leverage in terms of, or at least some leverage in terms of influencing its internal policies. When it comes to foreign policy, it is often said that the what goes on in the public doesn't influence a lot in terms of the foreign policies. You have mentioned about the Jewish funding, but there are also talks about the American strategic. Well, it's not just Jewish funding; it's Christian funding. It's a, yes. there, there's a there is a quite a broad and it's military industrial complex funding. It's it's a quite a broad coalition. Right, absolutely. And um, I was just uh, coming to the broad region in general, we are seeing a lot of tension with the, uh, around the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden and rockets being fired by the Houthis and then US-led coalition has sunk boats on the other side. And we are seeing constant firing across the Lebanon border since October 8, if not earlier. And Effectively, Netanyahu's uh, cabinet from Gallen to Gantz to his finance ministry, uh, Smotrich, they are essentially calling for war uh, against Iran. Now, to my mind, it's very difficult or it's, it's almost inconceivable to think about this very extended war by Israel alone if there is, if there is no thinking that U.S. is not going to support or back them up. Your thoughts on that? Well, if uh, the U.S. doesn't back up Israel, Israel can't even keep up the war in Gaza, much less a wider Middle East war. The war in Gaza is, uh, uh, is supported by U.S. munitions almost on a daily basis. So if uh, the U.S. Uh, cuts support, Israel has to stop, period. It's, it's not a matter of ex extending to Lebanon, the Red Sea, Iran. <laughs> that would be a major, major war, by the way, a major war, not only for Israel, but a major war for the United States as well. Uh, and the U.S. has just sent one carrier group back from 
uh, the region back to the United States. So it, it's a signal that the U.S. is not uh, at all interested in a wider war. There are uh, crazy U.S. politicians like Lindsey Graham, who loves war anytime, anywhere. And he said, uh, we need to uh, bomb uh, Iran. He used uh, even uh, more extreme language. But basically, this is not... Uh, uh, the, the uh, position of the Pentagon, uh, and it's not the position uh, of the American people. Uh, you raise the question of whether the public has some say uh, in foreign policy in general, not very much. But uh, being an election year this year, uh, it's strange, but foreign policy is much more on the agenda because there's a sense that Biden is incompetent, has lost control, that the U.S. is pulled into too many conflicts. And this is weighing on public opinion, especially because Donald Trump uh, has uh, been uh, against uh, funding Ukraine uh, and uh, the, but, Republican, but not, not the, Israel, Repu right? the Republican base uh, is uh, really not in favor of uh, this spending uh, or particularly in terms of these wars. It's it's complicated, but I think in general, the mood in the United States is, my God, we've got enough problems at home. What the hell are we doing getting into more and more and more of these wars? And Biden looks very weak uh, and uh, inconsequential, and he's a poor communicator in general. So this is a time when American public opinion is having an effect uh, especially in the Republican Party, which is not really wanting to fund uh, Biden's uh, adventures uh, abroad. I remember this foreign affairs column at the height of at the peak of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. It was saying that we should we should bump up our support for NATO. It's not not enough because the Republicans can come and they would definitely withdraw support and we should keep this going. And we would come to Ukraine. But before that, if you could very quickly, if you could lay out this eight point proposal that you laid out in one of your columns about how to achieve peace in the region. Well, it's uh, basically one point, which is I would like the UN Security Council today to vote uh, the state of Palestine as a UN member state and for that to be confirmed uh, by the UN General Assembly and to get on with the two-state solution. Uh, of course, <coughs> the current political constellation in Israel is dead set against this. Uh, it is absolutely uh, um, intent on complete control. Master. You Let's know, talk over, of, over, overseas, a lot of people call this the Newland administration, not the <laughs> Biden administration, because Newland has been there. She was Cheney's advisor. She was the Bush ambassador to NATO uh, when the NATO enlargement to Ukraine and to Georgia was put, this disastrous idea that got us into this, was put into the NATO agenda, by the way, over the huge objections of uh, the Europeans at the time. Uh, she was the ambassador to NATO under the Republicans. Okay, then she stays, and then she's the point person for the U.S. role in the overthrow of the Ukraine government in February 2014 that starts this war, because people need to remember, just get on a website and look at it. Uh, even they're admitting it. This war did start in 2022 with Russia's invasion. This war started in 2014 with the violent overthrow of the Ukraine government. And go listen to Newland on tape several weeks before the overthrow, talking about who the next government would be in Ukraine. She's already plotting this with the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Piat on a phone call that was intercepted. It's unbelievable. She was then Assistant Secretary of State for Pol European Affairs. Now she's Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. So she's that deep state, the one that transcends the political parties, that shows this is not Democrats and Republicans. This goes back to Cheney, to Bush. This goes to 
Obama administration. This goes right up to Biden. Come on. What is this? And we've known all along our own diplomats, William Burns, who in 2008 was the U.S. ambassador to Russia, cabled home, and people can find it online because it was covered by WikiLeaks. They can find William Burns' email, cable, that says, my God, if we push NATO enlargement, this is absolutely a Russian red line. And the Russians have explained, don't do this, why this is so dangerous. And Newland, okay, close your eyes, just go ahead, everything will be fine. And not everything's fine. Now we're in the middle of one war and at risk of another war and it, nothing is fine. Nothing is fine. I want to ask you back at the debt, <laughs> on the topic of the debt, uh, there are those Jeffrey Sachs who say, you know what, uh, we don't have to worry about the debt, so-called debt crisis, because our dollar is not backed by gold. We can just keep printing dollars. Uh, this is, I think, modern monetary theory. We can afford whatever we want. What would you say to them? Well, it's, it's technically right. Uh, what you do, technically, the Treasury borrows from the open market, and then the Federal Reserve buys that debt from the bondholder, puts money into the economy, and takes the debt back onto the books of the Fed. So it's no longer owed to the public. The debt is now owed to another unit of the government. But what happens is the money supply has gone up. So it is printing money to finance the war. The problem with that is that, again, you can do it to an extent, but if you do it too much, you get inflation. And in 2021 and 2022, we had a blowout of the money supply. I've been uh, a monetary economist for 43 years, I mentioned, international. I never saw it. In fact, it never happened before such a large increase of the money supply. And then you start having inflation. The first inflation was that every crazy uh, crypto currency soared in value. And then the stock market soared in value and asset prices soared in value and non-fungible tokens soared in value. But then it got into the commodities markets. Now it's getting into the real, you go to the grocery store, it's into the real economy. And so that's what happens when you print trillions of dollars, which is what we did in 2021, 2022. So you can do it. It's just that you have consequences when you do it. Don't, don't do it and think you're going to get away with it just uh, completely printing money. Lots of governments have tried that for actually a couple uh, millennia. It's called debasing the currency. Uh, and uh, you can do it for a little while, but uh, after a while, it, you know, you better pay your bills. That's, that's the basic point. Thank you. For those of you who just tuned in, I'm Marcy Winograd for Code Pink Radio. I am with the distinguished Jeffrey Sachs, economist, public policy analyst who's been doing this for decades, talking about this uh, debt crisis of anywhere from $24 trillion to $31 trillion, and the betrayal of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who promised that he would not deliver a blank check for military spending. And yet, uh, all talk of cutting the military budget has suddenly evaporated during this period in which he is negotiating with President Biden and demanding cuts in Social Security and Medicare, uh, food stamps, and so forth. Jeffrey Sachs. I wish, we heard, not, I wish we heard Biden saying, well, at least we'll cut the military budget. I'm not hearing that either, and no. neither of them. No. Uh, now, Jeffrey Sachs, let's say you're in the White House. You're in the Oval Office. No, you have hard to pen. believe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put you there for right now. And uh, you can, you're meeting maybe with uh, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and the minority leader, Hakeem Jeffries, and, and you say, look, this is out of control. This is a debt we have. Uh, we need to cut the military budget, slash it. What are you going to cut in that budget? First thing I'm going to say, you know, God, we thought we were going to bluff Putin and so forth, and just NATO enlargement was going to go on, and he called the bluff, and uh, now we're in this uh, ridiculous, horrible, tragic, destructive, expensive war. We're going to tell him, okay, no NATO enlargement, you go home. You know, in other words, we're going to negotiate the end of this which started with these provocations 
uh, of overthrowing a neutral government and overthrowing uh, the uh, sanity of uh, not moving NATO right up to a nearly 2,000 kilometer border with Russia and all that. So I would stop the war through negotiation. That would be the first thing. We'd save a lot of money. Second, I would say, look, we just had the accounting by uh, CIPRI, which is the uh, Stockholm Institute that keeps track of who spends what on the military. You know, the United States is spending more than the next 10 countries combined. And I'm talking about China uh, among those countries. We're spending three times China's military spending. We're spending more than the next 10 countries combined. Let's get this under control. Then I would point out that we have 800 military bases abroad. China, one or two, depending on how you count, maybe a small one in Djibouti, uh, maybe uh, one or two others. We have 800. Okay. We don't need 800 for our security. It's not adding to our security, it's adding to our debt enormously. So let's get this under control. Let's take out an Excel spreadsheet also and do this right. Real numbers, not gimmicks. Let's see what we need to do in taxes because God, there's so many loopholes here that it's unbelievable. But at the same time, let's stop waste on the, not just waste, tragic spending on the military industrial complex, because that is where we have wasted so much of our money. Yes, and when we create, create I don't like that word, it has a positive connotation, but when we produce, or the, the military contractors who are really making a killing off of killing, when they produce new weapon systems, these systems emit tremendous greenhouse gases. So there is that connection, and too often, we see environmentalists and peace activists operating in silos. And at Code Pink, we have a war is not green campaign because we think it's essential that we integrate these campaigns because the military is a driver of the climate crisis. The Pentagon is the single largest global institutional emitter of greenhouse gases, consumer of oil and fossil fuels. And too much of that is under the radar. So let's talk about it. Uh, Now, let's also talk about what we're doing at Code Pink this week and next week. We have uh, grassroots activists on the on the hill on Capitol Hill, Medea Benjamin, Olivia Dinucci, which uh, who many people met uh, when she disrupted. Uh, well, she's <laughs> she's disrupted a few times those powers that be that insist on you know, all of this uh, never-ending spending for the military, including Joe Biden. Uh, so anyway, they're going to be on Capitol Hill with others visiting key lawmakers' offices and saying, "Look, this is our petition, Code Pink." is a partner in the Peace in Ukraine Coalition, which represents over 100 organizations. We have a petition calling on Biden, Putin, and Zelensky to support a ceasefire and peace negotiations now. And I thank you, Jeffrey Sachs, because you are one of the prominent signers of that petition, along with others such as Noam Chomsky, Daniel Ellsberg, Dr. Cornell West, Anne Wright, Jack Matlock, the former ambassador to the Soviet Union, even Roger Waters, the uh, co-founder of Pink yeah. Floyd has, has signed that, as well as Dennis Kucinich, one of my heroes uh, who was in Congress for many years and, and a great peace champion. So we are taking this ceasefire petition not only to offices on Capitol Hill, but also fanning out across the country to deliver it to congressional offices, along with a, a full-page ad that ran in the New York Times last week. Thank you very much. Eisenhower Media Network, and this ad said, let the United States be a force for peace in the world instead of, well, I'm adding this now, instead of a force for war and destruction. Uh, There are those, however, Jeffrey Sachs, you know, there are those who disagree with this call for a ceasefire. They think it's controversial. They say, no, we cannot have a ceasefire because then Russia, Putin would end up with this annexed territory in the Donbass. And in Crimea, whether that was an annexation or reunification is certainly up for debate. Uh, What would you say to them? I think it's really important to get to negotiations and to understand the roots of this war. This war came because we kept pushing NATO. And at the end of 2021, Putin put on the table, actually, you want to avoid war, here is a draft Russia-US Security Treaty, 
and it had several points, the most important of which is stop the NATO expansion. And you know what the White House said? No way we're going to talk to Russia about NATO expansion. That's our business. It has nothing to do with Russia. Of course it has to do with Russia. We're about to put NATO right up against the Russian border. And so this was calamitously misguided foreign policy in the United States. And it's not just me saying it. The leading American diplomats have been saying this for decades now. Don't do this. George Kennan, William Burns, who's our CIA director right now, warned about this in 2008. And uh, William Perry, who was our Clinton's uh, Secretary of Defense, nearly resigned over Clinton deciding to enlarge NATO because Perry was saying, don't, we're going to start another Cold War with Russia. So it's possible to negotiate. But it's actually been, strangely enough, the United States that has absolutely rejected diplomacy. Uh, Americans probably couldn't believe that, but it's actually true. And it's at least two recent occasions. One is at the end of 2021, when Putin was putting a diplomatic initiative on the table. And we said, no, we're not going to talk about it. NATO enlargements, none of your business. That's what we told the Russians. And then at the start of the invasion, just a couple weeks after the invasion, Zelensky said, all right, okay, we could think about neutrality. We should negotiate. Now, I know what happened there because I've spoken to people that were deeply involved in this. Right at the beginning, the Ukrainians said, you know, we could really go to, we don't have to be in NATO, we could have uh, guarantees uh, from other ways. And the Russians said, okay, let's talk. And the Turkish di diplomats said, we'll mediate. And so real mediation started. And, and actually the former prime minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett, got into the act as an informal mediator. Towards the end of March, 2022, they actually we're working on the draft agreement to end the war. I'm talking about more than a year ago. And the United States said no. The United States said no diplomacy. Nobody questioned that in the mainstream media here because when's the last time you read in the New York Times a, a real understanding of this war? It doesn't exist in the New York Times. They just want, I think it was a joke on the New York Times actually, uh, they got some, you know, uh, somebody from the CIA or someplace in, in or the White House told them <clears throat> it was some people in a in a yacht, uh, you know, with six people in a boat. That story lasted about 24 hours. I mean, it didn't even last two minutes in my view. I thought it was hilarious, not uh, substantive. But the New York Times ran it with a straight face, but they wouldn't run Seymour Hersh's account and then discuss it. So they're not even covering the news and much less challenging a critical thought. And that, yes, I, that's, I, I would that's agree. pretty they, they, serious. The New York Times, the Washington Post, and their coverage of what's happening in Ukraine have really assigned themselves to irrelevancy because they are Pentagon PR flax who just repeat talking points. And there's no serious investigation into any aspect of this war and that's why, you know, at Code Pink, we support alternative, uh, non-corporate journalism. Uh, please tell others, Code Pink Radio will tell you the truth. Now, Jeffrey Sachs, let's talk about China a little bit further. Yep. Uh, China has come out with a 12-point peace proposal, which Biden immediately dismissed as, what did he say? He was, said it was irrational. Frankly, his response was irrational. Uh, meanwhile, we've had actual Code, Code Pink members have met with representatives of China in Washington, D.C. to thank the Chinese government for uh, coming up with this peace plan and for playing a positive, a peacemaker's role. I mean, whatever people think about China and, and whatever criticisms they have, uh, I think we have to be very clear that 
China, as you mentioned, has well, maybe one or two overseas bases. It's not a, a threat militarily. And it is trying to play the role of peacemaker, not just in the Middle East, but also in Ukraine. Uh, do you think that China, the global South, can make a difference here? I mean, because it's not just China, it's Mexico, it's Brazil, it's other countries too that are saying we need a ceasefire, we need it now because they know the security of not just Ukraine and Russia and the United States is at stake, but the security of the entire globe. First, I think people should understand a basic fact about China. China has not engaged in one overseas war in the last 40 years while the United States has been engaged in non-stop wars. We keep pointing our finger at China. Look at how militaristic. We vastly outspend China on the military. We have surrounded China with military bases. We've been engaged in constant wars. We are trying right now to break the Chinese economy. And uh, then we point our finger like the G7 did uh, in this recent meeting in just a kind of a hate-filled, ignorant session. Look at how evil China is. Look at how evil China is. It's so low level for anyone who really follows this. I was uh, actually myself in China last month. I've been to China so many times over the last 40 years. We're in a propaganda field right now of anti-China propaganda that has no basis in reality. And we're trying to create an enemy there so we can crush China because they're daring to achieve economic development. So this is the starting point. Now, in terms of China's uh, peace plan, it has one crucial point. And it says that a peace agreement should respect the security interests of all parties. What does that mean? That's code for don't expand NATO because Russia understandably regards that as a direct security threat to have NATO weapons on Russia's 1,900 kilometer border with Ukraine is not what Russia would like. Just like we would not be thrilled with Russian bases in Mexico or in Canada or any place else nearby. That's what Russia is trying to tell us. China gets it. China just uses very Confucian, if I could say, very nice orderly words respect to the security interests of all parties. And that means to the United States, would you, would you understand the, what, what Russia has been saying to the US since Russia was independent December 1991? Don't enlarge NATO. And especially since 2008, by God, not to Georgia. Are you kidding? That's what they've been telling us. And China gets it. And that's why Biden immediately rejected it. Because this is a game. The game is Newland's game to expand NATO to Ukraine. You okay? know, I think a lot of people don't realize, Jeffrey Sachs, that this has been a long time coming, not just in terms of you know, beginning in 2004 with the, with the greatest expansion of NATO, but also in 2020, we had uh, NATO recognize Ukraine as what I call a de facto member uh, with this interoperability agreement saying, you know, we're going to integrate our armed forces. Uh, now, what's the difference between being a de facto uh, member of NATO and an official member of NATO? Well, it could be what you're talking about, bases. It could be nuclear weapons. People say, well, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. First of all, they should all give them up, right? Uh, we should be pushing for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which NATO emphatically opposes. So NATO- uh, And by the, the way, if I may just- Yeah, weapons. if I may just say that I'm under the, the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, of which we are a major signatory, we are bound to nuclear disarmament, but we're not even trying right now. So we're not even- honoring the treaties that we're in, much less joining the treaties that we ought to be joining. So this is a, a terrible thing. And by the way, that's a huge budget cost. 
That is hundreds of billions of dollars that we're spending on, quote, modernizing the nuclear weapons rather than negotiating nuclear disarmament. So that's another part to come back to the budget story of the past. Mm -hmm. But this story of NATO goes back actually to the early 1990s. I spoke with a wonderful historian uh, recently who told me that in documents that he is reviewing, he hasn't published yet, Ukraine was already on a list for NATO enlargement in 1992. Now that's, you know, years before Putin's anywhere around uh, on this. This is a plan that goes back to the neocons with Cheney and Wolfowitz uh, in and Rumsfeld in the Bush administration. So this goes back a, and now I'll, interestingly, if you look up, it's it's a fascinating article. Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1997 in Foreign Affairs magazine. Mind you, this is before Putin's president by years. In 1997. Zbigniew Brzezinski spells out the timeline for expanding NATO to Ukraine. And he says almost exactly the sequence as it actually happened, because what he was writing in 1997 was not just his ideas. He was writing what was already in the works inside the government. So this is a story that goes back 25 years at least and it's been hidden from the american people and they thought they'd get it on a bluff the real idea of the united states was what's what's putin gonna do we're gonna expand nato and what's he gonna do and he's gonna complain and we're gonna say it's none of your business and we're gonna expand and that was really their idea then yanukovych got in the way yanukovych president of ukraine who said no i don't want Ukraine to be in in, uh, NATO, that's very dangerous, we'll be neutral. Well, (laughs) the US helped get rid of him. So this is a long, long story. None of it told honestly to the American people. And then if you say it now that this had something to do with the war, try to get it published in the New York Times. You can't. Jeffrey, people say, I've heard this over and over again, and they, quote, different people, unnamed people, I won't give them the credit here. Uh, They say, look, the reason why Putin has not invaded Poland, let's say, is because Poland is a member of NATO. So Ukraine needs this protection. (laughs) If if Ukraine were a member, an official, not just a de facto or interoperability uh, member of NATO, then Putin never would have invaded. That's possible. But you know what? Uh, The way we did it, we virtually guaranteed a war, period. In other words, uh, to say, okay, Ukraine, uh, yeah, you're going to join NATO, and the Russians are saying against our border, no. And then letting, as this uh, occurred, they said, you keep pushing this, uh, we're going to have war. And the war started in 2014, because the safety for Ukraine was when Ukraine was saying, we don't even want it, stop, don't don't get us into the middle of this war between the two of you. So the fact of the matter is this, NATO enlargement was completely unnecessary and provocative all the way back to the 1990s. And then we saw in 2019, Ukraine embedded in its constitution this vow to join NATO. Just to say, even the first round which was Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. The Russians hated it, but it didn't cause a war. That's far from their borders. Then the next round came, and the Russians were really, really annoyed because that one was on their border with the Baltics. So it was Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Bulgaria, and Romania. And then they said, oh, come on, what do you stop? Then in 2007, Putin said, okay, you've done it. You keep expanding NATO. You promised you wouldn't, but you keep doing it. Stop. Do not come up to our border with Ukraine and Georgia. And by the way, people should take a map out and understand a little bit about this. 
the real goal of these neocons, the Newland neocons, is to surround Russia in the Black Sea. This is why, where does Georgia come in here? I don't mean Atlanta, Georgia. I mean Georgia, the country, and the Caucasus. Where does that come from? If you look at a map, the idea of these neocons is that you have Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia surrounding Russia in the Black Sea. And Putin's saying, don't do this. Stop. And he says this in 2007. Then in 2008, Bush pushes this, and Newland is key member of the administration then. And they push this over the opposition of the Europeans and get the Bucharest NATO declaration to declare that Ukraine will be a member of NATO, will. And by the way, Biden has been part of this all along. And the military industrial complex has pushed this. The, lo the literal lobbies for NATO enlargement have been Raytheon people. I mean, you can't make this up. This is how the US government works. Lastly, Raytheon. Jeffrey Sachs, yes. I want to ask you about Ukraine and the future of Ukraine. Should we continue on this uh, calamitous path of endless war, uh, funding the propping up the Ukrainian government to the tune of $6 billion a month, spending over $115 billion to continue the war, half of that going to military contractors for weapons and, and military training. Uh, meanwhile, uh, what's going to happen to the Ukrainian economy because We've already read about Zelensky privatizing a lot of these industries that were nationalized under the Soviet Union. And we know that BlackRock, representatives of BlackRock have been over in Ukraine. And we know that Zelensky has a website. And on the website, there's a menu for privatizing Ukraine and, and inviting investors to, yes, invest in the military in Ukraine. Where do you see this going? Should we continue on this course? Look, Ukraine is being destroyed. This is the first tragedy is for Ukraine itself. <clears throat> Being a place where the US wages a proxy war is the worst place you can be. As, as Kissinger famously said, you know, to be an enemy of the United States uh, is dangerous, but to be a friend can be fatal. We are killing Ukraine. Literally, we're killing Ukrainians, but we're killing Ukraine. Think of how we loved Afghanistan, how we love South Vietnam. What do we do, Iraq? If, you're, if you are the place where the US is waging a proxy war, first of all, you will be physically destroyed. You will have mass out migration of young people, of talented people, of people just trying to survive for God's sake. You'll have your infrastructure destroyed. All of this, the, the Ukrainian economy is busted. And the, the Ukrainian population has shrunk tremendously because people have left the country. And so this is no way helping Ukraine. This is just, I tried to tell the Ukrainians, I'm, I'm for you. I'm not against you. This is, they kept thinking, oh, that's Putin propaganda. I said, no, listen, I go back to the Vietnam War in the United States, to Iraq, Afghanistan. I've seen what happens when the US grabs you in a proxy war. And this is what's happening right now to Ukraine. It's being tragically destroyed. And every time things don't work, our side ratchets up and they keep ratcheting up and sad to say you know obama knew in 2014 he he got the main point when he said and realized that russia has what's called escalatory dominance what that means is russia can meet us and raise the bet because for Russia, this is existential. For us, it's another war. Okay, we're going to expand NATO here. We're going to expand NATO there. We're going to do whatever we want to do. For Russia, they view this as the essence of Russia's national security. They have 1,600 deployed nuclear weapons. Obama realized this, said, 
I don't want to even start down this path. I don't know what this administration is doing. They have no plan. It's all, it's phony. It, and phony in the sense that they have no route to success, but they're in it up to their necks right now. Worse than that, <laughs> for Ukraine, they're in it above their heads. They're drowning in this violence. We've got to stop the fighting because there is no military path to victory because Russia can escalate and can escalate to devastation. And we keep and we were told, oh, don't say that. Don't 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 mention nuclear weapons and so forth. <clears throat> you know what? Mention them. Understand. Yes. And I think understand we should also, this. I think we should also mention, Jeffrey Sachs, that the United States says in nuclear posture review, the Biden administration says we will use nuclear weapons first if our allies' interests are threatened. So, you know, who's going to use them first or will they be used? All of this is speculation, but it's frightening that we are escalating right now, training Ukrainians on F-16 fighter jets that could... Uh, After they said again Russia. and again that they wouldn't do it, they keep right. taking the next step. It's time for the Newland administration really to step down so that we can have peace and have some sanity. Keep real, intensifying, and at an urgent stage. We're in, already in the acute phase of human-induced climate change, destruction of biodiversity, massive pollution, which claims many millions of lives per year. We're in, already the, in the acute phase these are of all public human-induced climate change destruction of biodiversity, massive pollution, which claims... We hear wisdom someplace. Uh... <laughs> Thank you. Um, these all require public goods of a new kind at a global, regional, biome, ecosystem scale. And of course, we're grappling with uh, creating that, and we're not succeeding uh, now 51 years after the first conference on environment and economy in Stockholm. We have rapid demographic change, not all bad. The world population is going to stabilize and start to decline in the 21st century. That's a good thing. We're completing the demographic transition, an aging economy, an urban world economy, a significant rise of Africa's share in the world economy to perhaps one fourth or even a third of the world population by later in this century. And we now, as I'm emphasizing, have public goods at regional, by that I mean transnational and global scale, to an extent that is unprecedented. And that requires a different kind of governance. So we have outgrown the nation state. We need political subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is the concept that we don't have competing polities at different levels. We have a kind of uh, concentric a circle of politics where global problems get solved globally, regional problems get addressed regionally, national problems get addressed nationally, local problems get addressed locally, with the basic dictum, go as local as possible consistent with the problem. And I think that this is the right idea about public goods. Uh, U.S. hegemony is a chimera, uh, very dangerous right now because uh, Everybody knows it except the United States. Uh, and so the US is actually provoking a lot of war and tension and conflict right now as it uh, struggles to come to grips with its limited power. And fourth, we're going to need an ethical basis for the global and regional public goods because all of economic life depends on an ethical formation, uh, shared precepts, implicit or explicit, and this now has to happen at a global level, and I'll give a few thoughts to that very quickly. I wrote a bit about this in uh, a book in 2020 called The Ages of Globalization, and my main theme was that to understand global scale change, we need to understand the interplay of physical geography, technological change, and institutional change. And all three are paramount in our own age. And of course, as a, as a materialist as I am, uh, I believe that uh, human history has essentially been paced by technological breakthroughs uh, and essentially in energy, food, transport, and data. 
data defined broadly to include computation, transmission, storage of information. And the major eras of human change are eras of breakthrough. Fire was the first era that enabled us to have larger brains, so the encephalization came with the harnessing of fire, the harnessing of agriculture, the domestication of the horse, uh, the uh, uh, discovery of uh, how to uh, mobilize wind and water power already uh, two and a half to three millennia ago. Uh, of course, the breakthrough with fossil fuel, with the steam engine in the 18th century, uh, with the electric dynamo in the 19th century, <coughs> nuclear age, and so forth. So all of this is to say we are very much paced by large technological changes. The dominant technological changes of our day came out of the uh, wonderful imagination of Alan Turing and John von Neumann uh, and uh, the uh, architects of the digital world with the transistors and integrated circuits. And this is a deep transformation that is uh, propelling us today. So in good uh, classical uh, enlightenment uh, form, I uh, approach this as a stadial theory of change, meaning you make stages. Uh, I uh, designate seven stages. I won't go through them in this brief period, but each is paced by major technological change, which gives rise to political change. It creates city-states, or nations, or empires, or transoceanic empires. And we are in another phase of fundamental political change. So just a word about the geography of long-term development. An unbelievable amount of uh, economic development takes place between these uh, narrow latitudes uh, because they are favored uh, in, uh, with the lucky fortune of a band of uh, east-west geography of temperate and semi-arid zone steplands and uh, temperate agriculture, which encompassed typically 70 or 80 percent of the world population, and almost all of the technological changes in history and the major empires line up incredibly along uh, this line throughout history. So in most of human history, Asia was, from as far back as we know it, the most populated part of the world, 65 to 70 percent of world population. China and India have been giants in population for two millennia, at least. And for most of that time, per capita income didn't vary so much as, as we know, and I'm using Angus Madison's famous uh, estimates here. Uh, it meant that the shares of output more or less tracked the shares of population with the modest variation for different periods like the Song Dynasty being a particularly uh, prosperous period in China, for example. Uh, but aside from the ups and downs, uh, Asia was the center of gravity of the world system. Then, of course, this began to change very gradually after the beginning of the 16th century in the so-called age of discovery or age of conquest. And it really took off after uh, the end of the 18th century because of the steam engine fundamentally, uh, the era of industrialization. And since that came to England first, uh, England uh, used that uh, uh, um, uh, to uh, conquer much of the world. Just to say, as everybody knows, it is the great accident of history that Europe became the first to industrialize uh, and to conquer uh, Asia because it was absolutely far more likely, I'd say something like 10 to 1 in favor of China in the 15th century, that it would go the other way. China was very close to discovering the sea routes to Europe and even possibly to the Americas uh, across uh, the uh, Northern Pacific. But in 1434, the single worst economic policy mistake in human history was made when uh, the mandarins at the Ming court scrapped the Chinese fleet uh, and just ended what was the mega age of uh, discovery and uh, oceanic transport of the giant fleets of Admiral Zheng He. 
absolutely no deep reason for it. It was a catastrophic mistake. The next time the sea routes uh, were opened uh, between Europe and Asia was Europeans going to conquer Asia, not Asians uh, going to explore and trade with uh, Europe. So Columbus and Vasco da Gama. And my favorite uh, lines from The Wealth of Nations, which is uh, a remarkably uh, wonderful and humane book, as well as a, a brilliant uh, treatise. But my favorite part is uh, this. Uh, Adam Smith says, the discovery of America and that of a passage to the Indies, East Indies by the Cape of Good Hope at seven, uh, 1498 uh, and 1492 are the two greatest and most important events recorded in the history of mankind. Big statement, not bad. Uh, connecting the whole world by these two oceanic uh, voyages. Their consequences have already been very great, but in the short period of between two and three centuries, because Smith is writing in 1776, which has elapsed since these discoveries were made, it is impossible that the whole extent of their consequences can have been seen. And then what's wonderful about Smith in the Scottish Enlightenment is he points out that while this was generally a beneficial fact to unite the world, it was disastrous for the native inhabitants of the East and West Indies, he says, because he says that they were relatively weak at the time. He didn't understand that they also brought pathogens of the old world to the Americas that wiped out the population. So Smith could not have understood that, but he did understand conquest. And he said something incredibly humane at the end, which I think marks him as one of the great thinkers of modern times. He said, hereafter, perhaps the natives of those countries may grow stronger or those of Europe may grow weaker and the inhabitants of all the different quarters of the world may arrive at that equality of courage and force which by inspiring mutual fear can alone overawe the injustice of independent nations into some sort of respect for the rights of one another. But nothing seems more likely to establish this equality of force than that mutual communication of knowledge and of all sorts of improvements which an extensive commerce from all countries to all countries naturally or rather necessarily carries along with it. So what Smith is saying is in the future there's going to come an equality because trade is going to carry knowledge, technological improvement, and an equality of force. Basically we are 250 years after Smith's writing and that prediction has come true now. So Smith was in the middle of a 500 year period. 500 years ago, Asia in the lead and the center of gravity and in the technological lead. Europe becomes the agent of change. The steam engine, a reflection of that, not something that came out of the blue, but came out of Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton and empire. But it came out of a Glasgow workshop. Uh, the condenser on James Watt's steam engine, and there came a new European and North Atlantic-led world. But, as Adam Smith said, eventually trade will rebalance, and that's the convergence that we're seeing now. So Watt's steam engine, historians are right to say that what was so fundamental about the steam engine is that it broke the organic barrier of the traditional economy. Because basically, all, almost all energy of the primary energy of the pre-James Watt economy was organic. What you could feed to human beings for their labor and what you could feed to the animals for animal traction, plus a little bit of wind and a little bit of water but basically an organic economy, and we moved to a fossil fuel economy, and that let loose the ability to do work of an unimaginable scale. So everything changed with the fossil fuel breakthrough in the last two and a half centuries, and of course Europe got there first, and Britain got there first of the first. And in the geopolitics, we ended up uh, with the British world. This is a map of a wonderful book, The Countries Never Invaded by Britain. Those are the ones in white. Uh, <laughs> Britain went out and just beat the shit out of everybody. And really nasty, by the way. Nasty. 
in 1839 showed up uh, in uh, China and saying, you have to import our opium. No, we don't want your opium. You don't want our opium, we'll beat the hell out of you. That was the first opium war. It was followed by the second opium war. No scruples at all, sorry to say. So that's power. That's the power of one-sided industrialization and it conquered much of the world. Long story, and I won't go into it, but the baton was passed to uh, the younger uh, Anglo-American kid brother uh, in 1945, uh, the great Anglo-Saxon handoff, and the US became the next empire. And the idea was that we would dot the world with 800 military bases around the world, and uh, Henry Luce made the sweetest love song to American leaders, telling them this is the American century. That is always captivating. It was captivating to Chinggis Khan. It was captivating to Lord Palmerston. Uh, and it has been captivating to American leaders uh, since then also to believe this is your century in the world. It's over, but we still have 800 military bases around the world. Uh, I believe the Ukraine war is likely to be America's Teutoburg Forest uh, defeat. Teutoburg Forest was the uh, lost by uh, Augustus uh, Octavian in AD 9 when the Roman Empire tried to cross the Rhine to the east to take over Germania and was defeated. It didn't end the Roman Empire, it just told them this is a limit and you're not going beyond that limit and the United States is going to learn a limit that NATO doesn't just expand at US will. There are limits to that and that's the painful process that we're in right now, um, but it's a secret. Don't tell anyone outside. Uh, you're likely to be canceled uh, if, if you do. Um, so the world changed fundamentally after the Second World War. The United States aspired to be the world leader, but something else happened to bring Adam Smith's forecast to reality, and that was the end of the imperial age. If there is one dimension of imperialism that I think needs to be understood, it is that imperial powers do not educate the natives. And if there's one dimension of economic development that needs to be understood, it is that education is the absolute central feature of development. Because without education, nothing else can happen. And so the European imperial powers left the world illiterate, left their colonies basically illiterate. At the end of the colonial rule, the first thing that happened was mass education. We're still not there yet, but this is the most fundamental breakthrough that happened after World War II, the end of the colonial imperial era, and the United States does its empire in a different way through regime change operations, so it's not exactly the same uh, as the occupation imperialism. But what countries got with their sovereignty was the ability to educate their people. And this has led to economic convergence. Just to show you the gaps, the peak of North Atlantic power was 1950 compared to the rest of the world. 56% of the literate world in 1950, roughly by my calculation, was in the North Atlantic region, meaning Western Europe, the United States, and Canada. Now it's 13% of the literate world. 60% of world output was in the North Atlantic region. Now it's 33% at purchasing power prices. 53% of all urban residents were in the North Atlantic world in 1950. Now it's 14%. The world's converged. Urban, literate, technologies have spread. Adam Smith was right that trade was actually the fundamental carrier of this. It was when China opened up that the acceleration of technological change came so fast to China. It was Japan that invented this process of rapid infusion of technology in the Meiji Restoration in 1868, and then again after World War II in its rebuilding. So we now see that Asia and the North Atlantic regions have crossed paths, again, using Madison's data updated by IMF data, uh, the North Atlantic was the dominant power until 
uh, this gap started to close in 1950. And by around 2010, Asia is now larger than the North Atlantic region. This is the real change of the world. We know that the BRICS, even before the recent expansion to six more countries, were already larger than the G7. That's a transformed world. And China, of course, overtook the US in GDP measured at purchasing power parity around 2014. But China is still much poorer per capita, maybe a third, but with more than four times the population. So this is the reason that China is a larger economy. So I want to argue very briefly that we're in a new age, a new age which I call the age of sustainable development. We're there in part because the scale of economic activity and a population 10 times the size of when Thomas Robert Malthus wrote The Principles of Population in 1798, which was then about 900 million people and today 8 billion people, now has put so much pressure on the physical environment that we are in urgent need of global public response to climate, biodiversity destruction, loss of ecosystem functions, and so forth. And the world adopted goals addressed to this. It's fitfully trying to achieve them. Today at the UN, this very day, is the midpoint review of the sustainable development goals. They're way off track. Nice objectives not being achieved, mainly because the United States and other rich countries don't care at all about it. Uh, and so the world governance is not organized to achieve these goals at this point. But these goals are the real global goals and needs. So we have a very perilous moment because we have arrived at multipolarity. And as Adam Smith talked about, that balance of awe and equality of force to create justice, that's a delicate, difficult, transformation. And just to say, there are several different theories of what's going on right now. Robert Kagan, uh, whom you may know is our chief uh, neocon ideologue and the uh, husband of our uh, acting uh, Deputy Secretary of State, Victoria Newland, uh, believes uh, that American hegemony uh, must rule and will continue to rule. Otherwise, the jungle will grow back, as he says. Uh, wow. Uh, Henry Kissinger says uh, that we need a balance of power theory. Balance of power is okay, except it becomes imbalanced, uh, and it's extremely difficult to manage. And when Bismarck was uh, thrown out by uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, it was the end of Europe's balance of power, and World War I came in response when Bismarck's genius at balancing was lost. Uh, John Mearsheimer says we are inevitably in tragedy. That's just the nature of great power politics. Mearsheimer is extremely uh, intelligent, predictive, an extremely nice person, but, it, but tragic to read because he says that conflict is inevitable. I don't buy it. Uh, now, another theory of, uh, that I read uh, 50 years ago of a uh, wonderful uh, professor of mine also, Charles Kindleberger, uh, said we need a hegemon. So if it's not the US or Britain, it's got to be someone else like China. I don't buy that either, uh, but this is a brilliant book. Boy, it led to a lot of late night discussions uh, over the next 50 years. Um, Graham Allison says, uh, as with Sparta and Athens, uh, we're prone for war, not inevitable, but uh, the war trigger is very high because of the rise of China. And my little contribution is, could we get our heads together and address global public goods and avoid global public bad? So I argue that we need a rational approach, not a tragic approach, and that it is not beyond us to reach the cooperative corner of the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, in other words, we can understand the game, we can understand the risks of defection, but we can understand the benefits of cooperation. 
and so we should be able to reach that cooperative outcome. So I would argue that we need a new geopolitics and a new ethics of sustainable development. I often refer to President Kennedy's inaugural address when he said, the world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. So what hangs in the balance is something extraordinary. We could achieve SDG 1, end poverty, or we could blow up the world. And what is absolutely incredible is how this is in the hands of a very few people. That's what's incredible. And by the way, my takeaway from Oppenheimer was what a bunch of geniuses that invented the bomb and what a bunch of dolts who use it or decide about using it. This is our paradox. It took the greatest geniuses of the age to understand nuclear fission and how this uh, could be created. And then it fell into the hands of uh, the everyday uh, person who might not have the imagination to keep us away from global disaster. That's technology, by the way. Technology is often created by geniuses and used by all of us. Uh, and uh, that is the real issue that uh, Plato was wondering about already in the Republic uh, 2,350 years ago. How do you make the rulers uh, know what to do? He said you have to raise them from birth for that purpose. So there are crucial public goods at regional and global scale. This is something new. Regional scale like the European Union or ASEAN or African Union. This is something new, how important this scale is. And global scale is almost unprecedented in human history. We had global trade, we had interconnectedness, but global public goods, not so much. Now we are with the center of global public goods, but institutions in the hands of nation states. Why? Weird. So I believe we need new kinds of global governance and ethics, and uh, I think the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a good place to start. We're in the uh, 75th anniversary this year, and I believe that we can even find a common wisdom, which I call the ABCs, uh, of ancient wisdom, Aristotle, Buddha, and Confucius. They all, by the way, were virtue ethicists. They basically said, cultivate your soul as decent people. It said it in somewhat different ways, but they said it's virtue that gives us the capacity to reach the cooperative solution, whether it's civic virtue, friendship virtue, or the other s virtues of sociality. And Aristotle said it's possible because but we love you, and we never go to war, uh, except in, in uh, bombing Belgrade for uh, seven straight weeks. Uh, and, oh, yeah, in Afghanistan, we occupied for 15 years as NATO, and, uh, and uh, the Iraq war was unprovoked. And, yeah, we tried to overthrow your ally, uh, uh, Assad, with the CIA regime change operation. And, oh, yeah, NATO took out Gaddafi. And, yeah, yeah, we are placing missiles uh, nearby you uh, in Poland and Romania because we unilaterally uh, abandoned the anti-ballistic missile treaty, but we're, we're peace loving and of course we're gonna move NATO right up to your 2,300 kilometer border. And not just uh, in Ukraine, but we're gonna do it in Georgia. Fascinating, by the way. People, please take out a map and look up Georgia, not the one uh, uh, in, uh, next to Florida. Uh, but uh, Georgia in uh, the Black Sea on the eastern boundary of the Black Sea, because that country is not a North Atlantic country. So why would it ever be in NATO? And yet the United States wants to push NATO to Georgia. And if you look at a map, I can explain in 30 seconds why that is because the intention of the United States is to surround Russia in the Black Sea. Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia creates an encirclement. And Russia's naval fleet 
the Black Sea Warm Water Naval Fleet is in Sevastopol, Crimea. And it's been there, by the way, since 1783. And there was already one major war in the 19th century between 1853 and 1856, where the British had the idea, get rid of that naval fleet. And in the late 20th centuries, Big New Brzezinski had the same idea of surround Russia uh, by getting Ukraine into the Western camp and actually into NATO. And then Russia ceases to be a major power is their theory. Well, to make a long story short, this is uh, the major reason for this war and we've never been told the truth about it. And that is really devastating. Second closely related issue is that in February 2014, the U.S. Uh, conspired to overthrow the government of Ukraine, and it did so. That's not a good move. If you're trying to push NATO and there's a president named Viktor Yanukovych who wanted neutrality, and you get together with forces inside the country and you uh, support the overthrow of Yanukovych, the violent overthrow, not a good look. That's when this war started in February 2014. And then if you look at the real sequence of events, not the, not, not the uh, uh, mind deadening uh, repeated mantra of the US government and the New York Times and blah, 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 that this is an unprovoked attack that started in February 2021. Uh, which 2022, excuse me, which is a nonsense. This isn't an unprovoked attack and it didn't start then, it started in 2014. But in 2019 onward, the US poured in armaments to build up a very, very powerful army. And when Biden came in, he doubled down on this whole thing because Biden and his team, Sullivan, Blinken, Newland, have been part of this story since 2014 and really before because Biden's always been a, an advocate of NATO enlargement. Biden's got some dark side still to be explained about Ukraine as well because of Hunter's involvement. We don't know what that is yet, but there's something not good at all about that. But I think mm -hmm. Newland has been on this case of NATO enlargement. She was actually the ambassador under Bush Jr. in 2008 to where? To NATO. In the 2008 meeting, when the US pushed the proposition and forced everyone to agree that Ukraine would become a member of NATO. So Newland's been part of this story from way back when, from the Cheney Bush days. Uh, and uh, she continued through the Obama administration days as the point person for the overthrow of Yanukovych in the US government and for the NATO enlargement issues. And then we started arming Ukraine heavily, especially in the late uh, 2010s. And then Biden really doubled down when he became president and repeated, uh, repeated uh, actually in several high level processes that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. And to bring us to today, and just to conclude, on December 17th, 2021, President Putin tabled a Russia-NATO security agreement in a draft based on no more NATO enlargement. And I happened to call the White House after that, said, avoid a war, negotiate. It's not even a concession. Why do we want NATO in Ukraine? It's going to provoke disaster. And I was told, oh, don't worry about it, Professor Sachs, but we'll never negotiate over NATO enlargement. It's none of Russia's business. And I said, none of Russia's business. Are you kidding? It's their border, 2,300 kilometers. How can it not be their business where the American military alliance is? But we are so arrogant that uh, we treated it as if don't have to talk to Russia about it. Then as soon as this uh, 
special military operation was launched in February 2022, Zelensky said, okay, okay, I could, we could be neutral. And they actually exchanged documents, drafts, and negotiated a peace arrangement a year and a half ago in March 2022. And I talked to the negotiators, by the way. I talked to the mediators, the Turkish government, in detail. And you know what happened? The United States came in and told Zelensky, no, you don't agree to neutrality. You fight on. We're, we have your back. You're going to win. You defeat Russia. Okay, now there are hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians dead. This counteroffensive of uh, June, July, August, and September is a killing field. Ukraine doesn't have the weapons, the manpower, the training, the air cover, the artillery to do this, even if it were desirable to do, they don't have it, so they're getting smashed. And Biden doesn't have the gumption to say, you know, this was a terrible blunder. We need to agree that NATO won't enlarge and save Ukraine but rather, oh, we're all with you for as long as it takes, meaning how many more hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians dead as long as it takes? Oh, come on, I'm 68 years old. I know what it means as long as it takes. It means some moment the U.S. leaves. That's what it means as long as it takes. With a lot of dead in Ukraine in a country that has been absolutely pummeled by artillery nonstop, basically, on both sides since February 2024, uh, 2022, but with a lot of shooting and killing that took place since February uh, 2014. This is terrible. This is destroying Ukraine. This isn't protecting Ukraine. And so this is the real story. But again, the government lies to us. We don't get to debate it. And if you say it, you know, you're a, a, you're a Putin propagandist, you're called. But I have written an op-ed in the last couple of days that I've uh, put online, where the Secretary General of NATO himself, someone I know quite well for a long time, Jens Stoltenberg, said when he was speaking in the European Parliament that Putin went to war to stop NATO enlargement. But we don't have to negotiate with him. Well, great favor to Ukraine. It's interesting. I'm just looking at this map from what you're saying. And yeah, uh, NATO has successfully, nearly successfully, completely cut Russia off from various bodies of water. I mean, you've got the Black Sea, what you're mentioning, and if they could get Georgia uh, and the rest of Ukraine, and, you know, they, then they'll have every other area around that Black Sea. The Baltic Sea yep. as well. They, yep. they've you got cut it. them off from the Baltic Sea. They got it with Finland. These, these are choke um, points. Yeah, right. What, what, why do you think they're trying to do that? What is the, why cut them off from the, the Black Sea or the Baltic Sea? I'm curious if the Caspian Sea is next. I mean, is yeah. that what you think they're going to go after that one as well? Look, I, I don't know if uh, you have uh, used to play Risk. You, uh, do you know that board game? Uh, yeah. It was a yeah. board game of, of my youth. Uh, the idea was to have your piece on every uh, part of the world map. Then you had taken over the world. Well, that that's uh, that's the neocon uh, vision. They're playing risk, uh, playing risk at the expense of uh, of vast numbers of deaths in many parts of the world. They want to have the U.S. military or subservient governments or supplicant governments or pliant governments everywhere on the map of the world. And uh, this is pretty relentless. Uh, and it's, a, it's kind of manifest destiny writ at the global scale. It used to be at the continental scale. Nothing could stop us. We take over all of North America, uh, Native Americans notwithstanding, uh, and so forth. Uh, this is a manifest destiny at the global level. Uh, the only problem is others don't quite share this idea. and. Uh, we are getting into an awful lot of wars and they're very dangerous, very dangerous. This is a war with a nuclear superpower and obviously a very powerful military. And uh, Russia has 6,000 nuclear warheads and they're gunning after China. At least a lot of 
politicians in Washington. I think in the last few weeks, Biden is trying to pull back a little bit, I think, from the brink, uh, but scared always of his right flank that he'll be attacked for being soft on China and so forth. But there are a lot of hardliners on China that seem really to be preparing for war. Can you imagine anything more reckless, stupid, unnecessary, potentially uh, Armageddon than that? I can't. So all of this is mind boggling to me. But the basic answer to your question is no rational reason other than that they think they're playing global hegemon and they need their peace on every part of the map.